brought moral and ideology into porn. And when I say moral and culture, I mean a reference to the culture of the day and to the morals of the day. Um, it has, pornography has since then always been more than sex and on film because um, it can tell us something about our world, our society and uh, about our cultural taboos. In 1968, Denmark was the first state to legalize pornography. In consequence, uh, Scandinavian hardcore pornography became widely available. And this coined the misleading term Sweden porno for any film produced in Scandinavia. This is one of uh, Lasse Brown's films. Um, he was actually Italian, I think, but um, <laughs> produced pornography in Sweden and uh, smuggled it out of the country using his father's uh, diplomatic status. That was... <laughs> Um, 1969 saw the first sex expo, the Sex 69, where many sex tourists from neighboring European states attended because in other states pornography wasn't legalized then. 1970, finally, was the year of the first modern pornographic film. It was called Mona the Virgin Nymph and is even listed in IMDb in the Internet Movie Database. It was feature length and plot-based and, of course, produced in Sweden. <laughs> and at that time, porn desperately wanted to go mainstream because um, they, the porn producers dreamed of a merger between Hollywood films and pornography. Um, that included feature length, uh, higher budgets, putting a focus on narrative and plot, also um, paying more attention to technical professionality. And uh, Deep Throat, which you probably all know, and Behind the Green Door are two examples of early modern porn. In the second part of this lecture, I would like um, to direct your attention to the very, very difficult question of defining pornography. Um, since the beginnings of erotic literature and pictures, there have been attempts to define pornography and to define what, what is obscene and what is perverse, for example. Philosophers and lawyers and academics and anti-porn feminists and pro-porn feminists, and they all try to define what pornography is, and they all came out with very different results. And there's a quote I would like to paraphrase for you that sums up the problem best. It was um, uttered by Justice Potter Stewart in a, in a court case being made to ban, ban a potentially obscene film. And he said, I don't know what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> and everyone trying to define pornography uses different criteria and a different status quo. For example, the only common criteria academics could agree on was that pornography seeks to arouse its consumer. But what is arousing and, and for whom? I mean, images that are perverse and shocking to you um, could be a big turn on for me. Uh, in the words of Ruby Rich, <laughs> if I like it, it's erotic, but if you like it, it's pornographic. <laughs> Um, for me, uh, pornography has to fulfill certain technical criteria. Of course, there's, in this topic, there's nothing like a black and white definition of such a fleeting thing. Um, there are gray areas, and you will think of a thousand counterexamples to every example I will give you. But the following is just an attempt to bring the whole confusing thing into some sort of order. So um, the first point for me is Pornography is media-bound, meaning without a medium, pornography can't exist. It's all about the degree of abstraction that is needed to read the text of pornographic imagery, and that is very vital to its existence. Without the medium to further pornography's distance to real life and sex, it ceases to be pornography. For example, I would argue that a porno you can find on the Internet is indeed pornography. But a performance where two or more people are fucking on stage, that's not porn, that's sex. 
because the layer of abstraction is removed. The second point I would make is pornography is fictional, imaginative and iconic because pornographic films are staged. They're choreographed, lighted, edited, they're credits and sometimes even titles. Um, the films are dubbed when they arrive in Germany and sometimes there's even a soundtrack. All of this adds to the abstraction and the artificiality of audiovisual porn, even when there are non-narrative sequences. Um, a gray area here, of course, is the field of amateur or privately filmed porn. Um, and the, the, the border between pornography and documented sex is uh, thinnest in this genre. Um, finally, the third point I would make is uh, pornography is produced for an audience. Imagine for a moment that um, my best friend had an orgy recently. He documented on film. So the first criteria, pornography is media bound, is fulfilled. He cut out the parts where they had to sort out all their respective limbs. He even lighted the scene and added the end credits of all the participants. Um, <laughs> that would fulfill criteria number two. But he didn't show the video to anyone except the participants and some friends who know all the participants. So since everyone with access to the video is either a protagonist or a close friend, the position of a disinterested audience is not given. The degree of abstraction is thus lessened because all the people involved, because I as a viewer, I know all the people involved, and I, ca I have no chance to devise any sort of fiction from the scene because I know their real names, I know what their jobs are, and um, this makes it really unsexy, probably. Um, <laughs> but as soon as the footage is released, say, on the internet and has an audience to whom this orgy is a part of fiction, um, it fulfills all three criteria and becomes pornography. Um, Audiovisual pornography is definitely a product devised for mass marketing and profit, and it can be assumed that there is pornography for every existing fetish, and there is no fetish that doesn't exist. Um, it is artificial, I think, but not planned to be art. But however, in public discourse with an informed audience or with analysts, it can become art. At least well, that's what I think. <laughs> After the first modern pornos, there quickly came the development of home entertainment systems. And uh, this eventually led to the format war between VHS and Betamax in the 70s. And there is a very popular urban legend that states that uh, VHS won because of pornography. Um, of course, the reality is multi-layered, and there's more than one reason that played into the success of VHS and the failure of Betamax. VHS won because um, the length of the tape. That's the main reason. Because VHS tapes ran for two and a half hours, and Betamax tapes ran only for one hour. Customers wanted to tape TV shows or features, and they were often longer than one hour. Um, also, porn producers began, began shooting their footage on videotape. Um, they wanted to lower the production costs, and as a result, porn moved out of cinemas and was put on VHS tapes, because at that time, porn wanted to go mainstream and had feature-length film. Um, it, as it went into people's private homes, um, the customers were able to watch pornographic films in the privacy of their homes and they didn't have to endure the humiliating act of entering a smut cinema anymore. And um, yeah, that's why VHS practically became the medium du jour for, for pornography. Right. And the birth of the, and development of the internet um, <laughs> saw a rapid rise of uh, new and revolutionary pornographic distribution models and practices. I won't tell you from the beginning because you're all experts there, I assume. <laughs> I will just give you some statistics. Uh, in a recent uh, statistic um, quoted on, on Heisen News, which is a German um, technology news service, um, it was established that 60% uh, traffic of peer-to-peer -peer networks is pornography. 
On the other hand, um, a recent uh, 2006 statistics, which used a random website sample from Google, says that only about 1% of those websites um, were, had sexual content. Mm, I would like to give you some example of a new kind of pornography, which is um, interactive pornography. What you see here is um, a screenshot from um, Second Life, which is a computer game. And um, in, that, in that game, avatars can be programmed to have virtual sex. And um, whenever they meet, you can have uh, virtual uh, relationships. And there's even one guy. He's the guy who makes. Uh, also, he, he's the guy who makes slash dong dot org, which is in the lower le lower right corner. And he used um, a modded force feedback uh, console joypad to translate the stimulations from the video game into real life um, vibrations. <laughs> And also, what I found uh, today, actually, on Flashbot, was the <laughs> vibrator. <laughs> you can um, program the V remote uh, to to uh, send out signals to. Uh, to a Bluetooth receiver, which then sends those signals to a USB device, like a USB vibrator. And so if you shake the remote up and down, uh, the vibrator moves. And <laughs> there... <laughs> As you can see, pornography has become, or interactive sex has become so versatile and fleeting that it's hard to make trend prognosis. There are a lot of things like this, and they're, even, they're coming even more. And um, there is a clear preference for interactive elements. Uh, this, I think, is just a plaything. But uh, in future, I think the abstraction of um, Playthings like this will grow further apart from the wish for authenticity and, and real compassion in sexual relationships. There is one last thing I like to say. That is, uh, pornography is not bad, and so you can really uh, admit if you see it. Um, but please, next time you watch a pornographic film, try to spend some thoughts about what it tells you about the world and you. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Um, yeah, do I you think, think so that uh, pornography may be or may have been uh, um, a driving force in the development of technology, for example, in sending uh, pictures over mobile phones and uh, things like that? I'm sorry, I don't understand a word you're saying. Um, it's, it's not you, it's just uh, the loudspeakers. I can't really hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you think that pornography may be or may have been a driving force in the development of technology? Um, yes and no. Because, um, well, it's very hard to find hard facts on um, technological developments and pornography. It's a lot, there's a lot of urban legends and speculation. For example, I think it's clear, to, it's, it's safe to say that we wouldn't have broadband internet without pornography. Because um, there were, uh, first there were scanned pictures of nudie magazines in, in uh, news groups, and after that um, 